this computer. Uh, hello. Okay, so hello and uh, welcome to my podcast. I'm your host, Larry Lou, and uh, today I'm very delighted to be joined by uh, Diane Pagan. Uh, she's a fellow contributor to uh, our volume that we brought out, and we'll also link that in the description box uh, on uh, the politics of UBI uh, and uh, various uh, activist campaigns that happened uh, throughout the country and all over the world uh, with respect to universal uh, basic income. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us here, Diane. Thanks for asking me. Uh, yeah, so uh, I would think we'll start uh, uh, perhaps with, uh, you know, your the life story and, I mean, how you uh, uh, started out and how you became engaged with uh, UBI as a topic. Uh, okay. Um, well, so I'm from Queens, New York, and... Um, I've went to, I have, I have a brother and a sister and we all went to public schools, uh, in New York city. Um, and I was always sort of interested in, I was really more, uh, interested in art and writing as a high schooler. And I was uh, very interested in languages in particular, I took French and I took, I also took uh, Spanish later on. And I was always just interested in languages and people living different ways, you know. And um, I decided to, when I went to college, I decided that uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do, you know. But I, kn I knew that I, I had wanted to just go to college just for knowledge's sake. And I figured that I would figure out over the you know, over time, what I wanted to major in, and I ended up majoring in languages and working in uh, publishing, you know, publishing a magazine, uh, I sold advertising, I did all kinds of work, you know, um, unrelated to UBI or any other thing. And then, um, then I got but I would volunteer a lot and I was a big reader and I decided that I wanted to go to social work school. So uh, a few years, several years after I got my bachelor's, I went to Fordham University Graduate School of Social Work and that's how I became a social worker. That's also how I met, how I got interested in basic income because someone that I, uh, someone whose book I read during social work school was a UBI activist. Uh, so there was uh, Teresa, right? Teresa, Teresa yeah. Finichello, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, how, how did that encounter work? I mean, did you, so you, you read her book and then you, you met her afterwards and had this discussion? Yeah, um, so I had, a, I had a wonderful boss who was a lifelong acorn organizer named John Beam, and he's no longer alive, uh, unfortunately. Um, he did a lot of, uh, a lot of work for ACORN and he was an organizer throughout his life and um, and he had it on his shelf when I was I was in his office one day perusing his books and I looked at it and it caught my attention you know the title caught my attention and he said you should really read that book and I said okay when can I read it and he handed it to me and I took it home and I read it I read it very quickly because it was a really excellent book um, but the premise was very disturbing because uh, Teresa contends that um, among the other problems of poverty is the problem that there's a whole social and uh, and labor class that benefits from perpetuating poverty and that social workers are part of that class. And so I was pretty, you know, perturbed by the idea that I was just going to make the world worse. And um, so I called, I asked uh, John if he knew her and he said that he did and he gave me her phone number and I called her 
and we ended up meeting and talking about you know ways that I could be I basically said to her I don't want to be a part of the problem do you think that I should keep going to social work school and she said let's talk about how you can uh, you know be a social worker and not be part of the problem and so then we got together and we you know it's a little blurry now because it was it was a little while ago right but um it was about 2002 but she essentially took me on as a part-time worker while i was in social work school and i designed an internship for myself that got approved and i worked for her not for profit for a number of years uh, could, could, could you perhaps unpack a little bit for the non-social worker audience uh, mm. what uh, what it means for a social worker to be uh, contributing to poverty uh, rather than ameliorating it because I mean I would think you know, very naively as non-social worker that right. you guys are doing uh, a good job of uh, you know uh, taking care of homeless people taking care of uh, disabled and vulnerable individuals. So, uh, mm -hmm. so could you explain perhaps to the non-social worker audience uh, why you th you think your occupation is part of the problem? Um, well, because we're we're working for a system that's not intended to wipe out poverty, and so everything that we do that is done within this system doesn't get anybody any closer to not being poor. Um, you know, that it's complicated. It doesn't mean that there are no good social workers. It means that there are many good social workers stuck in a bad system and that we, we, as we ourselves need to reform the system so that it has an end game that, that an end game that is ethically sound, which is making sure that everyone has what, you know, their basic needs met and making sure that, uh, they're afforded dignity you know, the dignity of being human at every turn and that we're not exploiting them to generate income for ourselves. Um, you know, just to give an example, you know, if you're in a homeless shelter, uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty well known throughout the social work world that uh, once a person goes into a homeless shelter, that actually the amount of money that is generated in income for uh, for the, the shelter provider and for the mental health providers and for all of those people far exceeds the amount of money that it would cost us to house them as in you know as individuals or as families in in regular apartments and um, you know this is just this is just known. And in fact, in New York City, uh, recently, thankfully, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, the, the homeless system has been in the spotlight a lot. It should have happened much sooner, but it's been in the spotlight a lot recently because of COVID-19 and because the fact that um, essentially COVID has exposed the fact that the living conditions in shelters are um, contrary to good health and and safety and um, so there's been a lot about the fact that you know we really politically what what is necessary now is to move people out of shelters um, because congregate shelters are not you know you can't maintain social distance and you can get you can spread any virus or any illness faster than you would if you were in an ordinary apartment. I see. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so you have a lot of, uh, so, so uh, do you want to add something to your uh, biography and, you know, uh, how you sort of moved on? Uh, um, yeah. So let me see. So, I mean, I've always been interested in these things, right? And I became more interested in them as I, when I got out of, uh, you know, first of all, when I went to social work school, I did I did do a couple of other internships before before I met Teresa Funicello. I, you know, the prior year I did a couple of internships, and they were 
you know, and they were very much service oriented in community centers. Um, and, uh, you know, a counseling type internships and stuff. And, and, and of course, you know, a good part of the time people were upset because they had no money. And so it, it seemed like torturing them to me to have them come and talk to me about their problems. And I, all I could really do was give them pep talks and maybe help them to avoid feeling frustrated, but I couldn't solve their income problems. And so, you know, that's probably kind of opened me up to UBI. And then when I found out about that UBI was a thing uh, or guaranteed income, I really got fascinated because I was sick of feeling terrible about not being able to help people and kind of the absurdities of offering solution that doesn't fit the problem. So when I got out of social work school, I worked for Teresa for a while and we got, you know, she took me to the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network conferences. Um, I think with that the first one I went to was, it, I believe it was in 2004. Um, I might have to check that. But, you know, I met a whole bunch of people that were working on, that had already been working on, um, on basic income for a couple of years or even more than that. And I just got more and more into it. It just made more and more sense, you know. Um, but, the, but the main issue that you were describing here is that uh, a lot of the clients that you had were struggling with uh, financial concerns, right? I mean, it was the inability yeah. to uh you know pay the bills pay the electric bill pay the food uh mm -hmm. or you know not having enough money at the end of the month yeah uh, that you know sort of puts them into uh the you know welfare bureaucracy right mm -hmm. so that, that was the main concern yeah that was that was often their main their main concern and um not exclusively right but you know, it really was a majority of the time that was a concern. And um, the more and more I learned about the system that that we have, I realized that actually there is there is no system. You know, there is no reliable income stream like there is in a number of other countries. However, imperfect. Um, you know, there are plenty of other countries that have a more reasonable. Uh, cash benefit and some of those benefits in fact are in they're they're at least partly universal in that you know if you if you meet just one uh one qualification one thing that they need for you to meet you get it for example the child credit in france you know you have a baby you get the credit as long as the child is alive you get the credit um, and nobody asks you how much you have from other places or, you know, whether you really need it or what you're going to spend it on um, and things like that. And there are other countries that have similar things. So, as you know, uh, you know, to support people's income. And here we don't have that. Right. So, and uh, so there was this book by uh, David Graeber, and I think he titled this, uh, you know, Bullshit Jobs. Uh, and uh, he has a very, you know, long quote that he has about uh, welfare caseworkers uh, who basically feel like they are uh, also working in a job where they have to police uh, every move that, uh, you know, welfare recipients are making Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, they would want to offload the frustration. And I think the only way to do that in their mind uh, would be to uh, perhaps give people a basic income, right? <laughs> that, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. And they should get one too, you know? Um, right, because yeah. the argument would be that, you know, once you 
uh, make the welfare state non-punitive, right? Everybody gets it. Yeah. But presumably, you also don't need the welfare case workers to be on people's back, right? Right. Uh, so that's an interesting argument. Yeah. Uh, so you so in the book you uh, you have a very interesting example. Uh, I think Hurricane Irene uh, is a quite important case. So could you explain to your listeners? Uh, what that was about? Sure. So um, in 2000, uh, let me think for a second. In 2011, I, I went upstate. I was living upstate for a time. I left a social work job down here and I went upstate. And um, I was a child protective service worker. And um, that, that job is um you know there those jobs are usually a, the state system the state child welfare system and um so i was a child protective services worker and i would respond to different uh reports that come into a hotline of possible neglect or abuse of children so that was that was what i was uh that was my job in 2011 and um in august of 2011 there was the hurricane irene and hurricane irene um there was a lot of concern before it hit that it was gonna be very bad in new york city and actually what ended up happening is what was that it basically sideswiped new york city and didn't cause much damage at all um, and in fact, you know, uh, not knowing much about climate and how these things work, um, it didn't do, it didn't actually do much damage upstate either, but the aftermath of it, because of the extra water and this and that, a lot, you know, upstate is full of rivers. And so a lot of rivers overflow, overflew their banks. Um, and there was a ton of flooding and there were several small towns that were really hit very very hard um there was a there was a factory uh, that made american flags upstate that was completely annihilated by the flooding um there was a small town called fleischman's new york which is the demographic is um partly Jewish population and partly um, part, partly Mexican nationals, um, and that was completely flooded as well. And so, you know, what happened was a lot of people lost their homes because of flooding after after the hurricane. And and um, so there were people who were homeless and they had to set up. Uh, they set up a homeless shelter. They, they set up a shelter for people to sleep in that was on top of the mountain. Um, I can't remember the name of the place, but it's normally it's a ski resort. Mm -hmm. And um, it's in Catskills. And, um, you know, and a lot of people just had extensive damage and, of course, extensive job loss. <clears throat> there were a lot of women who worked in these very small Catskill hotels who lost their jobs. And it was, it was a disaster. It was a total disaster. And, um, but, you know, uh, we don't even have a, an income distribution system for, for poor people during, during non-disaster, in non-disaster conditions. So you can imagine how bad it was in a disaster. You know, it yeah. was very hot. It was midsummer, you know, it, it, very hot out. People couldn't get places, their cars were ruined. And the people who did have cars had no money to put gas in them to travel around. Uh, and, you know, and the solutions, you know, the, the same solutions that we always, that we always go to are these, you know, basically like standing online solutions where everybody lines up and tries to get things that they need, you know? Yeah, so I, th I think you have the example of uh, the surplus clothes in like a football stadium. I mean, can you explain Yeah, that? 
Uh, yeah, so there was a small, there was a, I mean, it wasn't a, a gigantic stadium, but it was a, you know, sizable, a sizable stadium in, in upstate New York, um, you know, used for ball games and stuff. And um, so what happened was, you know, as you can imagine, and this is, this is a story over and over, right? It, ha it happened in Haiti. It happens when there is earthquakes that people out of the goodness of their heart, answer the call of the system to donate stuff, right? Because our system doesn't ever ask, you know, never, never advises you to go out and hand out money to people, right? They say donate stuff and we'll make sure that people get stuff. I have to apologize. I live in Brooklyn and oh, there's no so worries. many motorcycles. I don't know what's going on today. No worries, no worries. <laughs> So uh, maybe, if it gets bad, I'll close this window. So, um, so in any event, so people, you know, they, they, they got together and, you know, they, they brought clothes to the police departments and the fire departments and the churches and they set up boxes and they put all the like clothes in them, you know, and then they had food drives and people would line up for food and you know the lines were just very very long lines where you'd have to wait a very long time in the hot sun you know no shade um and then you would just take whatever you know whatever had been donated somehow the logistics of it you know uh, volunteers and many of whom had also lost their homes right were, you know, out of the goodness of their hearts, they were trying to organize like these care bags of like a few clothes, some food, you know, bottled water. Now, the amount of labor that goes into that is astronomical, you know, and the, and the logistics of trying to make sure that, you know, family A gets what, gets what they can eat and what they need and family B gets something else, you know, it's very, it's very individualized, you know, and that's why, that's why when, when, when we have natural disasters like that, there's always a call, um, you know, like in, in like really big natural disasters, for example, like Sandy and like the earthquake in, in, in Haiti, where the big not for profits are always, they always say, well, you know, please don't send goods, send money. But of course, as you know, since you're not sending the money to the individuals, you're sending it to the not-for-profit, you really don't know how that money never gets used to just hand money to people, right? So upstate, you know, there were some monetary donations, but they didn't make it to individuals. The only thing that made, made it to individuals was clothes and food and water. And, you know, there was some relaxing of the food stamp uh, regulations to try to sign people up faster for food stamps. But that had its problems, too, because, you know, um, in order to sign up for the food stamps, you would have to make it to a place that was signing people up. And so, you know, up in upstate New York, that entails getting in a car and, and so on. Anyway, you get, you kind of get the point. So, um, so basically what ended up happening was, you know, as is usual in these kinds of, um, in these kinds of situations, you know, people would go into the church and they would take, they would take what was useful to them. And that's what you would expect, right? You don't want them to take things they don't need. So they would take what was useful to them, but that in large part was not necessarily clothing. Um, clothing's a very cheap commodity and people don't, even in a disaster, um, you don't necessarily, it's not necessarily the main thing you need. Really what you need is income and you need new, new housing and et cetera and things that you can get with money. And so people took some things, but there was a lot of clothing left over. And people didn't need it. And so eventually after, you know, having all of this, all of this effort go into, you know, 
volunteers and goodwill to collect clothing and try to sort it and do all of that other stuff, it ended up that, you know, there was a large amount of money of, of clothing left over. And um, so it was all sort of amassed into this, you know, ball field place in Sydney. And, you know, people were encouraged to go and get some. And of course, most people didn't bother going because they didn't really need it. Mm-hmm. So it ended up just being thrown away. Yeah, it's a, it's a total waste and a very uh, inefficient system. Uh, so I believe in an earlier draft in the chapter, you uh, talked about uh, uh, two individuals, I think, who uh, were, they needed to drive uh, somewhere and uh, they needed to have uh, enough gas money uh, to get there and then you had uh, an argument with your supervisor about uh, you know how to uh, you know best help them so could you explain uh, that story sure so again um, you know this whole system that we have is predicated on the idea you know this this very classic classic idea of um, of you know moral the moral failings of people who don't have money right and so this goes back hundreds of years and every what ends up happening is that it it overrides any sense of common sense and logic it when you're working in social services um and you're always defaulting to this space where even when something is pretty straightforward you're sort of conditioned to not to not just give people a benefit of the doubt you know and to never give more than people need because it'll be bad for them or something and um so anyway um so I was at the same job, you know, uh, it, this was uh, actually after, this was after I, Irene, somewhat after Irene, actually, it was sometime around Christmas, I think. And um, I had someone who I had, uh, they had come to my awareness because someone had filed a report of possible neglect against them. Um, and as it turned out, it wasn't really, um, you know, there really wasn't anything to be terribly concerned about. But of course, this family, just like many other families, was doing, you know, very, very erratic seasonal work, um, as is often the case in upstate New York, reliable, and they had some help from, they had some help from us, from, from the state, um, with food stamps and a couple other things. So, um, so it turned out, so one day I get a phone call from the, from the parent, one of the parents, and, you know, she says, my husband actually has been working, like I told you, you know, he works construction, and we haven't been, we haven't been getting, you know, he hasn't gotten paid recently, but we just were told that he has a check waiting for him. And the check is however many miles away, you know, where he was doing his construction work. Um, We need to get there, but we have no money. So I told my supervisor and she told me to calculate, you know, to look into it, to calculate how far they had to go and let her know and that we would give them a, like a card, a gas card, you know, that they could use at the gas station to, to get gas. And so, you know, long story, the long and short of it is that I think that, you know, they were going a certain number of miles and they had to, you know, go and come back. And, and I was told to calculate, um, and, you know, how much gas their car takes and how far they had to go. And then I was to do the math and come up with the number. And, um, you know, and I rounded it up probably like 20 bucks or so because I wanted to make sure that, you know, nothing went wrong and that they didn't run out of gas. 
and I was told that, you know, that I had rounded it up too high and it ended up, you know, being cut like almost to the exact calculation of what they needed uh, to get where they were going. And I, I mean, I didn't argue the point that much, but I did point out that, you know, if, if we were off a little bit, it was going to cause a big problem. And even that way, I was told that the solution to that, to, to, to make sure that that didn't happen, to make sure that, that the, the people who were going to, you know, take the trip, make sure that they don't, um, you know, get it in their head to go anywhere else. Like, you know, don't stop at the gross, don't take advantage of the fact that you have a vehicle to like run any other errands, you know, go see anyone that you care about, you know, because that's what normal people would do, right? <laughs> but they're normal not allowed to, yeah. you know, yeah. and so they just like, they had to travel the whole way, you know, you know, and my, and I myself was pretty nervous the whole time you know, worrying that something might happen and that if I had miscalculated it, that they might stall or whatever. So, you know, that's kind of the way it works. And, it, and, and by the way, and the, you know, the worst part of that is that, you know, it probably, that whole thing, that whole task probably took like the better part of my work day. So mm -hmm. in addition to the time and stress that it caused them, it also consumed, you know, uh, my labor plus fringe, you know, whatever I was getting paid yeah. to be there, you know, that I couldn't spend helping somebody else. I mean, it's very interesting when the, the political right makes the argument against uh, the nanny state, right? People are supposed to be independent and things like that. But, but uh, our welfare state very much is a, is a nanny state in the worst possible form if you are, yeah. uh, if you are too poor, right? Uh, yeah, so you, that's awful. So you have another story about uh, a domestic abuse case of, of a welfare uh, recipient. Um, you know, I mean, without, of course, naming the, the person, but uh, could you maybe describe some uh details in that uh, story well if um i'm not uh, if you're referring to the are you referring to the one in maine uh or are you referring to a different one yeah because i think there was one person that uh basically got killed by yes, uh, yes. by, by a lo lover uh and uh, the fact that they lacked that that she lacked cash Right. That yeah. She so let me. Independence. Yeah. So actually, to correct, you know, just to make sure it's totally accurate. So this is not a person she she was in a relationship with at all. Um, this this person was uh, someone who was sort of lived in the neighborhood where she went. She and her children were staying and. Um, you know, basically noticed her, you know, and uh, part of the reason that, you know, she came to his attention is because in, you know, it's very typical in when you're staying in a homeless shelter, apparently in, in, in other states as well, it's very usual that the, the shelter often will not let people remain in the shelter during the day. And mm -hmm. that's to sort of mirror some kind of notion of a work life, which hopefully this is going to change now that everybody's at home. But, you know, the, the idea is always, again, you know, what are normal, what do normal people do? You know, you know, and we don't, you know, normal people can't stay home. And, you know, even though they're taking care of their children, you know, the, you know, the children are in school or whatever. And so you can't even stay home and rest. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you're in a shelter, you're not allowed to stay during the day. And if you don't have anywhere to go, you go to places like libraries, laundromats, public places, parks, this happens all over. And, um, and so this woman, you know, had to find ways to spend her time outside of the shelter since she wasn't allowed to remain in the shelter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so there you have the disregard for her mothering, right? Because she's a mother of two boys. 
-hmm. And then, um, so, you know, spending time in the library and stuff, this, this person in the neighborhood noticed her. And I guess he, you know, he wanted to talk to her and stuff. And he, you know, and he quickly, I guess, assessed that, you know, this was her situation, that she didn't have any money and she was in the library all the time because she didn't, she couldn't stay in the homeless shelter. And he found out, you know, a lot about her. And, um, you know, and a lot of the time she didn't have enough money to feed her children, which is, um, which again goes back to the fact that the welfare system doesn't provide enough. And so uh, she started, you know, he, he would insist on buying her kids meals and, you know, and she, what are you going to do? You're a parent, you know? And so she, she accepted his generosity for a while, you know, and, um, and then he started to become too interested in, in being around her to the point that it was like, she didn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and she, and then she, she got an apartment, you know, and then, uh, shortly after, I think maybe the, a day or two before the caseworker was supposed to move, go with them to move the family to their new apartment. Um, she went to do the laundry and, you know, she had already told him that, that she was going to be moving and, uh, he got jealous and he was not well in the head. And actually it, he had committed, he had committed, um, crimes in the past. Mm -hmm. He had committed a murder in the past and he had been released after doing a couple of decades in jail. And so um, he killed her. And, you know, um, so to the extent that being poor also puts you, you know, kind of makes you very vulnerable because she was put in a position where she had to, she had to accept, you know, uh, interacting with someone that maybe, maybe it didn't really sit right with her. You know, he, he wasn't, he, he didn't have good intentions and he was a violent person. And she, you know, this is the kind of stuff that happens to people when they don't have money. Yeah. And yeah. So it's a very sad story, you know, and now he's back in prison and, you know, and he, uh, and the, you know, those two boys are being raised by their grand, their grandmother in Maine. Yeah. It's it, it, the, the tragic story that comes out of, uh, poverty so let's uh okay so i think those are all the cases that, that we have for um individual stories uh let's go more on the policy level so mm -hmm. uh you had an encounter uh with the you know chief government coordinator of a welfare office um i think in arkansas right um yeah and then, and then you had an you could say a confrontational en encounter uh, with that uh, government bureaucrat. So could you uh, explain uh, that situation? Sure. So um, in 20, was it 2018? No, it was tw in 2019. I, I went to a, a conference in Washington, D.C., and uh, the theme of the conference was uh, examining uh, social insurance for, for the future, you know, the integrity of social insurance for the future. And, you know, it's a great conference, by the way, if you, if you ever get a chance to go and mm -hmm. if we ever go anywhere again, um, the yeah. National Association Organization um, they do excellent work on social security and just the different programs involved in social security and they have an annual conference. So you know, usually change up the theme and it's great. And so um, I got invited to go, um, not to present, just, you know, to attend. And I went and I was very surprised to see uh, that they were gonna have a panel on Medicaid Mm -hmm. And that one of the speakers was the uh, um, the commissioner of 
of uh, Health and Human Services for Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I happen to know, you know, because I study TANF a lot, I happen to know that um, Arkansas has a terrible, uh, just a, just like a shamelessly bad uh, public assistance system. And so, um, you know, they, they basically, their, their, uh, their grant, I'm not remembering the exact number right now, but their grant is about $200, maybe it's $210 a month for a family of three. Um, and, uh, you know, they have, uh, they don't do a very good job of enrolling people. They have very low enrollment. Um, and that's all by design, you know? And so when, when she was, and, and furthermore, um, if you, you can look up, Arkansas Medicaid got into quite a bit of trouble. Um, of course, no one gets punished in any way, um, but they got into quite a lot of trouble because um, uh, I think last, the year before last, they, um, the way that they were reducing their Medicaid roles was they decided that people on Medicaid had to prove that they were either working or job searching. Mm -hmm. Now, so, you know, in rural Arkansas, that became very, very complicated because a lot of people didn't, they either didn't have consistent internet or they didn't have computers. Um, they had trouble using the system. There were glitches and invariably a very large numbers of people got kicked off of their Medicaid, even though they were eligible. So this is the person that was, you know, the person that's like has primary responsibility for all of this is Cindy Gillespie. And she was the person at the, at the, um, at the, uh, conference, you know, talking in the session. So I asked her, you know, during the question and answer, I asked her, um, you know, since the, the, uh, the theme of that particular session was improving health outcomes for poor people, right? Mm -hmm. And so I asked her, you know, if she could basic, basically, would she please like relate, you know, the design of their TANF program to their mission to improve health for poor people because mm -hmm. I didn't see how they could just, you know, how I said it would be really, really important to, to recognize how low your TANF benefit is and how detrimental that is to the health of, of the people of Arkansas. And, you know, she was very, very surprised that anybody asked because, you know, it was a very, um, you know, it was, a, it needed to be asked, you know, and it was the right place to ask it, but it was sort of unexpected and it was contentious. And, but she basically admitted that they have a, an extremely low benefit. Um, and she agreed that there's a correlation that's indisputable between being poor you know, and, and poor health outcomes. And I asked her why she doesn't consider doubling or tripling their monthly welfare grant, because right, even if she tripled it, it would be, it would still be below 40% of the poverty line if mm. they tripled it. Yeah. So, you know, I asked her if she would consider doing that. And I pointed out that she has a, a large amount of um, of money in unspent funds accumulated in her Arkansas TANF. And, you know, I told her how much she had. And, <laughs> and, and she said, she basically said that she was, quote, open to trying everything. But of course, when I followed up with her, you know, she gave me her number afterward, you know, but I, I think that that was probably, you know, just to be, uh, you know, at the time I was very satisfied that she had given me her number. Now I think she just did it to be proper um, yeah. because I'd never been able to reach her after that. So. Right. So, yeah. so, the, so the issue that you describe here is that uh, 
there's a lot of money in the system, uh, in the currently allocated welfare system, mm -hmm. uh, but that there are certain bureaucratic rules and norms in place, uh, which uh, make it really difficult uh, for benefits to be dispersed. Correct. Um, and, Correct. And, I, and I was wondering, I mean, what are the bureaucratic means by which you do that i mean so i guess you describe how people are uh you know not having access to the internet so maybe not being able to access the forms uh would be one issue i mean so what, yeah. what are the mechanisms that the state uses to exclude people from getting benefits so one way they do it is you try to cut down on the number of time <laughs> um so one way they do it is uh, you know, like in the case of Arkansas Medicaid, right, they, they implemented this idea that everybody had to um, check, do these check-ins to say that they're working, you know, and, um, and so to the degree that people had, that there were any glitches, you know, there were glitches, some people didn't have access, you have some families that don't have computers, um, you're in a rural area where there maybe the libraries aren't open on weekends, what have you, um, and people got kicked off. And um, so that's one way that they did that it played out with Medicaid. With with temporary assistance for needy families, the primary way that they keep people from, uh, you know, in the very low paying states. Um, the primary way that, that people are kept from enrolling is their, well, number one, you know, there, 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 there comes the point in which it becomes, it actually will worsen your quality of life in a way to, to apply. Because remember that that $210 is not as little as it is, it's not even just an income transfer. It's an income transfer with an expectation of, of um, compulsory work attached, right? Because of the 1996 uh, Personal Responsibility Act that Clinton passed, that Bill Clinton passed. And so, um, so if you're in a state like, you know, Arkansas and you have two kids, and you know, you apply to get two hundred and ten dollars a month. You're expected to show up somewhere thirty hours a week and do something. And it doesn't matter if it's make work, like David Graver, or like David Graver might say. You know, it doesn't matter if it's something ridiculous. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, that doesn't really contribute to the community or make anything, you are expected to, you know, go to one of these job training programs, et cetera, which then again, are you know, big contracts for whoever, you know, uh, tells the state that they'll do, that they'll provide that job training or that, that job experience. So if you're in a, if you're an adult and you have a couple of kids to care for, are you really going to commit yourself to 30 hours of, um, you know, compulsory dead end drudgery, um, you know, and put your kids in a daycare for it, you know, if they're little in exchange for $210? I, I would say you're probably going to figure out a different way to get $210 that doesn't include you you know, also having to be time impoverished, you know, and what happens is that in a lot of states, people don't, they just don't sign up because the benefit is so low. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's the main way, but then the other ways that they do it is, you know, if, if the, you know, people are rational, you know, and if, if the, if the services were really high quality and they brought, they made people's lives better, then, you know, more people would enroll in a particular, you know, in a, in a particular state. They, you know, 
I'm sure of it, but you know, the fact that so few people enroll is kind of a testament to the lack of uh, return you get, you know, it's, if, if you're not finding that, that service or, or that benefit useful and it's more trouble than it's worth, then, you know, you're not, you're not going to take part, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah it's really bad. The, the, the trends on the enrollment are, are, Every I can I can send you a couple of documents about it, but the trends are basically every fiscal year you look at most states and every year their caseload has gone down by thousands of people. Yeah, I, I, I mean I was wondering what the sort of uh, norm is inside of the state bureaucracy inside of the welfare agency. I mean, is it the case that if you are uh, you know, managing the state program for, you know, Medicaid or food stamps or, or TANF, uh, that um, you get a quicker promotion if you uh, can reduce the roles uh, of, uh, you know, for doling out benefits. Uh, I mean, that, that would be sort of an interesting thing to know right because yeah it would be very interesting to know i mean what i can tell you is that um every state at the end of their fiscal year every state has millions of dollars left over with few exceptions there are some states that that, that use all their funds you know uh i'm not i'm exactly sure whether i could say that they use them well um but they use them and, but those are few and far between, you know, if anything, maybe one or two states spend down their entire federal block grant and the rest just sock it away. Right. You, so they, they, can, they can use they, it for other purposes. Rolling yeah. It over. yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, one of the things that they say is, Oh, we're going to use it you know, it's good for us to have a little on hand in case of a disaster. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, uh, so, I mean, as you might know, I mean, we have a lot of uh, activism currently regarding uh, Black Lives Matter and then also the defund police campaign. I mean, I, I was mm -hmm. wondering whether uh, that logic would fit in here because you have effectively a defunding of social services Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then if you look at uh, spending on police and incarceration, mm -hmm. uh, th those seem to be the, the state programs that uh, are expanding, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think it, it would be very consistent with, um, with everybody's concerns about um, discrimination, prejudice, and oppression against uh, black people and brown people in this country, I think it would be very, very um, appropriate to look at TANF with a critical eye and consider, you know, extensive reforms that involve um, defunding it at least at least defunding sections of it that are that have proven to be very oppressive and in generally speaking um you know there's a lot of it, it's kind of a, a larger much larger deeper conversation but um you know the typically if you look at if you look at the uh, the benefits you know, the benefit amounts for um, the different states, right? Um, the South, the band of Southern states has easily has the lowest benefits. And that's, um, that's a vestige of, of white, you know, white government officials mm -hmm. not wanting to give a dime to black mothers and just, yeah. you know, making it just impossible for, for them to meet the needs of their families on these tiny grants, you know? And um, so that's like kind of, it's kind of like uh, 
it's carried on all this time, you know, even when it, even when it was, when it was um, aid to families with dependent children, the mm -hmm. benefits were low. They didn't cover very many, um, pr you know, proportional to the number of people that were truly in need. It didn't get to everyone, but it did way better. AFDC did way better than TANF in reaching people. Um, in a state like, for example, um, I was recently on a, I did a webinar um, a couple of weeks ago about temporary assistance for needy families. And one of the guests was, um, I can't remember her title, but it was a very interesting webinar. And um, she was calling in from Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, and Alabama is one of the very historically low benefit states. Maybe people get $205 a month mm -hmm. um, in, in Alabama. And at the time when I was listening to her talk, she got really into like how many, how many um, welfare offices they have to tend to the public and stuff. And it was proportionately, it didn't make any sense. Like you're, you're thinking about it because although I don't have the exact number in my head, she made a reference to the fact that, well, first of all, in Alabama, only 10 out of every eligible uh, families get TANF. So 10%, yeah, 10. Um, and then she mentioned how many state offices they have that serve people that are on TANF. And although they serve other purposes too, there are like a certain number of TANF offices that are staffed, right? Mm -hmm. You have to light them, you need phones, you need all that. And she, when I figured it out in my head, mm -hmm. each TANF office was only serving maybe 70, 70 uh, clients, maybe mm -hmm. 70 families. Now, why would you have a whole infrastructure for, you know, for a building to serve so few people? You know, and, and as she's talking on the phone, you know, she's acknowledging too that the system is not meeting the needs of Alabamans. She herself is saying, well, as you know, we have very low enrollments, but she's saying it like it's not, it's not saying it like this is a problem I want to fix. She's just saying like, as if it's data, like, well, as you know, we have really low enrollments in Alabama in our temporary assistance program. But then she didn't go on to discuss how she thinks that should be fixed. She was just like, this is what we're, this is the way it is, you know? And, and so all of this, you know, not, not, you know, it's not that the Northern states are much, much better, but it's just that if we're talking if what matters to this country right now is this, you know, we've sort of had this like shock of all, of these, you know, various murders and assaults against black and brown people. Mm -hmm. What's more, you know, assaultive and murderous than, you know, taking a black family in Alabama and refusing to give them cash assistance mm -hmm. or giving them $200 when you know they need, at a minimum, they need four times that, you know? Um, poverty is the worst form of violence, right? It's, we've heard it over and over, and, um, and it really is true. So we have to not only look at police violence, but, you know, I think that the whole police matter, you know, of, of reforming the police and things like that is very, complicated and it's a very worthwhile thing and we mm -hmm. and the urgency is real but we can't stop there because we've got a whole bunch of you know all, th this kind of oppression is writ into everything mm -hmm. you know um to 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 divert wealth from the poorest communities and in the south it's you know it was done with the intent of keeping um, black and brown families basically poor enough that being emancipated wouldn't really make one bit of a difference.
Yeah, I mean, I think this racial versus welfare discourse is very uh, interesting here because, you know, for, you know, if the welfare state were to expand and it would, you know, service people's needs better, uh, mm -hmm. you know, poor uh, white families would also benefit uh, from those arrangements too. But it seems yeah. to be that, you know, the politicians, uh, especially in the South, are capable of uh, splitting uh, people purely on race um, grounds. Um, okay, so uh, so the last set of questions for this podcast uh, will turn to the activism uh, part, and uh, you know you had this uh, meetings with uh, James Felton Keith and Andrew Yang. So these are two very prominent uh, supporters of UBI and of course Andrew Yang ran for the presidential campaign in for the Democratic Party. Uh, could, could you uh, tell the listeners I mean how you got in touch with these individuals and with the broader basic income movement? Sure um, so I actually um, it, although we have not had we have not had um, a, a basic income meeting we I, I run a group with uh several ubi activists called basic income nyc and we started that in 2016. um you know that was sort of a it, around 2015 or so is when even though i know that you know, if you're looking at it, if you're if you're coming to UBI now and you're looking at it, you're like, oh well, you know, some people say, oh well, it started with Andrew Yang when he ran for president and he decided that he wanted a universal basic income. And of course, that that isn't the case. Um, there are many people that came before. It's definitely the case that um, you know the UBI community. We we have you know, that, that Andrew is, is a great friend to the community and he's part of the community. And, you know, we're blessed that he ran for president. Mm. <clears throat> um, you know, he accelerated the conversation about UBI probably by 10 years, if, if maybe even more, you know, I don't know, but, but for sure. Um, but around 2015, you know, as somebody that kind of got in, started getting involved around 2002, 2003, what I can tell you is that there was really no, at least in the United States, there was really no on the ground activism for UBI. Mm -hmm. uh, the first number of years that I was uh, going to these conferences and stuff, it was very theoretical. Um, you know, it doesn't mean there was no activism. It just means that there wasn't enough to move a needle forward, you know, and, and, and whatnot. And um, there was, uh, and there were, there were some campaigns, there were some activism campaigns around income, but they weren't exclusively for universal basic income. Mm -hmm. So then around 2014 or so, um, I remember that in that, uh, in that U.S. Big Congress, the Basic Income Guarantee Network Congress, uh, there were more and more calls to start doing things that were political, to start involving politicians, to start calling politicians and things like that. And a man named um, Al Sheehan, have you heard of Al Sheehan? No, no, no. Al, Al Sheehan passed away a couple of years ago, but he was a wonderful, very long time activist for UBI. And um, he wrote a book about UBI and um, sort of to simplify it very, it was a really, really good book, just, you know, Q&A on UBI. Mm -hmm. And he reached out to, he, he was like one of the first people to reach out to a, to a federal representative and talk to the representative, um, he was in California, so he reached out to a federal representative and he tried to get a bill put together for UBI. And at, at that point, that was like 2014 or so, there was no traction, you know, there was no traction whatsoever. It might have even preceded that by a little bit. But anyway, um, you know, around 2014, a lot of us that were going to the Congresses and stuff, we said like, look, you know, 
we have to shift something because you know there's more and more of us we've got lots of data mm -hmm. you know like how many how many more white papers can can you stand to read you know <laughs> and then if you don't have any activism it's not going to go anywhere so we yeah. started getting active and in 2015 um, a few of us from U.S. Big started a group called Basic Income Action, mm -hmm. and then, long story short, um, that group was able to do a little bit of funding to local people um, who just cared about UBI and they wanted to start to uh, do local activism. And so um, we created a group in New York called Basic Income NYC. And we've been holding what we call basic income movie nights mm -hmm. since 2016, more or less monthly for since 2016. The last one was actually uh, right before the basic income march. Um, we held one in, in Harlem a few months before the basic income march. And we have not we have not held one since because we took some time off after the march. You know, mm -hmm. everyone was pretty knackered after yeah. that. And then we were planning one for um, February, and then <laughs> suddenly, and then like yeah. nobody could go anywhere. So you know, it was. Um, so we'll see where that goes, but 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 that's the activism piece of it, and and so Andrew. Um, I, Andrew sent some of his staff to our basic income movie night in, um, in December of 2017 mm -hmm. to kind of scope us out and check out what was going on. And so that's when know, he started his campaign, right? I think in November of 17 or something, right? Um, well, he announced yeah. in February. Oh, February, that's right. Yeah. He announced February. officially in February 2018. And, and I, yeah. I actually, I had him come back in February of 2018, um, mm -hmm. you know, to be like the surprise guest. And that was really a pretty great night as well. But he came looking for us to kind of, you know, see what was going on in basic income NYC. And, um, you know, and that was marvelous, you know, and, and I was really happy to get a chance to help out at the beginning of the campaign um, with a number of, you know, events and things like that and, and try to be helpful where I could. Mostly talking about this kind of stuff, yeah. you know, about the, uh, the, the potential that UBI has to, um, to make our current system either more accountable or to replace it, you know? Um, I'm not a fan of the categorical idea of replacing TANF um, as a legislative thing. I think that it should be organic. I think that TANF is really, um, it's very flawed. It's for all the reasons that we just discussed, it's really flawed. And we should implement a UBI and then just TANF will have to reform to provide some kind of meaningful service to, to the people that are enrolled in it or it will collapse under its own weight and then we'll defund it and we can roll it into UBI or some kind of superior social service system because TANF doesn't even very, really have very quality um, social services in my experience. Mm -hmm. And keeping in mind that I've only been a social worker in New York, so I can't speak for every social service program, but in my experience, um, the social service aspects of it, like trainings and mental health and things are not that good. But if you think yeah. about it, why would they be? What, what incentive does TANF have? It has compulsory participants. Where's the incentive to have a good service or, or a good product? Mm -hmm. There is right. none. But it would be much better if you, you know, paid people you know, in, income and then they do 
whatever they like with that. I mean, so have, have you heard, I think, uh, Andrew Yang, I mean, through his podcast, I found out uh, that he was raising money from uh, Jack Dorsey and perhaps other individuals because mm-hmm. uh, he's a Twitter CEO. He has a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so it's basically kind of like a give directly campaign where mm-hmm. uh, through the foundation that Andrew Yang runs, yeah, uh, and they're trying to give cash directly to uh, needy individuals. Um, yeah. So I can attest that someone, someone I know, received uh, two hundred and fifty dollars um, from Humanity Forward, Ready forward from that yeah. project. Yeah, and um, he's very low income, and he's uh, using it to uh, repair his wheelchair. So he uses the wheelchair and his wheelchair is broken. So the quality of life uh, immediately goes up even just by the, yeah. Immediately. I mean, that's an essential thing if you have to use a wheelchair um, and he's had no luck. You know, he's got, you know, he's got a lot of uh, social service agencies involved in his life and he has not been able to get anyone to subsidize Okay, I think the so much better. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely important uh, to have uh, you know uh, a much better social policy, which would be less punitive. I think that. Yeah. I mean, I I, I, I mean, I took a course in social policy back in uh, Oxford, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, there was this one book by. Uh, Robert Walker, it's about, the title was Poverty is a Shame, right? And, 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 and I think the big point that he was making, because, you know, when, when I study social policy, I mean, my idea is, it's all about numbers, right? It's all about objective needs and, you know, calculating, you know, poverty figures. Um, but, uh, but the way how Robert Walker was framing it is, uh, no, it's about, it's about emotions. It's about dignity, right? Uh, and the fact that, you know, uh, you know, if you if you have a welfare state that is only trying to target at the very poorest individuals, uh, then the receipts of uh, welfare becomes shameful uh, to the extent that it could actually deter people from wanting to claim these benefits because they think, well they don't deserve it. While on the other hand, uh, one successful poverty targeting program is the earned income tax credit. Mm. Uh, and actually there's been research on the EITC uh, and you know how people are using those funds. Uh, and that's actually the one government benefit where you know the, the, the poor income individuals that are receiving it uh, are actually um, you know, they, they feel like it's rightful for them to, 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 to use it for, you know, whatever they want, really, because it is a cash right. benefit, right? It's like, right. I think, you know, a few thousand dollars a year. Uh, so, um, so it's really important to include the moral dimensions in, in, in poverty. Um, and yeah. yeah and, I, and I think you have a great perspective on, uh, on, on how this, uh, whole system works. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's all the questions that I have. Uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Diane, for coming up here on this uh, uh, podcast. Uh, and also thank, thank all you. Ministers. Well, thank you very much. And I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed writing the chapter. So, Good. Yeah, I appreciate I mean, that very well, much. Well, thank you for contributing to that. Yeah, good group of people. Yep, that's beautiful. Mm-hmm.